everybody. Sorry for the slightly late start. We were waiting for people to come online and for others to turn up. So welcome along to uh, the second um, of our Seed Practitioner Workshop. The first one was oversubscribed, so hence we, by popular demand, uh, had this second one um, scheduled. And it's great to see many familiar faces and many new faces, which we hope we get a chance to, to meet you. Um, to, first of all, just the safety instructions. You follow the little green person to the exits and Brookfield place behind us is the muster point. All fairly straightforward. Um, I also like to acknowledge uh, the Wadjuk Noongar people and lands that we are meeting on. But most importantly, um, the research that you're about to hear represents work that we've done with the Talarak on Talarak lands, Wadandi land, Yamaji land, um, Baladong people, Naju and Matu lands. So um, part of what we're doing now is all of our publications. We acknowledge those indigenous lands that we work on. Um, and it, I think we are the first group to actually do that. Hopefully that becomes a pattern of the future. Um, the seed node has been one of the really interesting and challenging nodes for us out of our six pillars that we have within the CMSR Centre. Um, and the seed node has been a challenge simply because of the diversity of seed from our sites from the Pilbara through to the southwest, uh, a huge number of species uh, estimated at around eight and a half thousand species, not all needed on the mine sites, uh, but all s containing significant species, many for which we had no information at all. And over the last five and a half years, the six years that Simon's been involved in seed and uh, Adam before him, we've gradually worked our way through them. There are still roadblocks in the system this is not about the solution to every species, but it's to show you for those species that we do have solutions, some new and effective ways to go forward. Why is this important? Um, I sit on the UN Decade of uh, Ecosystem Restoration Best Practices Panel. If you log on to that, that was launched uh, last weekend. Uh, that was a global launch for the UN Decade. It runs from 2021 to 2030. That's to put 350 million hectares back to a sustainable and resilient ecosystem. In some cases, that will just be returning some level of function to otherwise totally degraded lands. In others, it's putting back full forest woodlands, uh, heathlands, montane systems around the world. And in that, one of the key issues was the fragility of the seed supply chain. All of those programs draw upon native seed, all except a handful in Europe and in parts of the Great Basin, Midwest and the US, all rely on wild collected seed. And in Australia, it's almost totally wild collected seed that is used in our restoration, both for the mining industry and for the broader remit that we're seeing across the landscapes of Australia. Is that sustainable? Is it robust? Is it likely to deliver the outcomes that we need? We posit that we need a new journey in this country to migrate to seed production areas. But in that journey, we believe there's a way to economise, to get greater efficiencies through optimising both the input of seed into the system through quality assurance and quality testing. And Simon's going to go through some of those developments all the way through to how do you make every seed count in the restoration agenda. And our model in driving the centre has been to look at a typical agricultural operation. So there are farmers now that with a single 50 tine air seeder can seed canola across a uh, thousand hectares a day with, a, with, with great efficiencies, with every one of those seeds counting. We need to be able to think in that space if we're going to go forward with ecological restoration on the scale that we need to do. Whereas the, whether it's the UN decade of restoration or the three big words in restoration now, carbon, carbon and carbon, if we're to get the carbon economy delivering the conservation benefits that are going to be so critical going forward, then we need to look at the biodiverse elements in that. And that's going to matter because not only do we get more resilient carbon, and uh, Curtin is working, as is uh, our colleagues in UWA, on the resilience of carbon that we get 
through biodiverse uh, plantings, but it also provides add-on benefits, particularly for indigenous communities and other economic opportunities, everything from honey to alternative sources of uh, healthy soils, better water, re reduced salinity. So importantly, of course, biodiversity credits system is also coming into the space. So the, the we carbon credits and biodiversity credits soon to be uh, part of the formula in the way that we restore and repair our landscapes. So that's why having biodiverse systems and robust seed supply chains and effective systems to deliver seed will be so important. And it was interesting, just this morning, I mean, this, this is a global tsunami of the nicest form, the need to restore the planet. And Joe Biden has been extraordinary. We've seen a transformation. I wrote to a colleague today saying, we've gone from the dark ages to the age of enlightenment in literally seven months since Biden's come in in terms of the transformation, re-energising of the entire environmental budgets of the US. And they were some of our champions and they've been really silenced over those uh, pe the period of the Trump administration. And the National Academy of Sciences in the US today came out with a key statement saying the seed supply chain is one of the weak links in getting their robust system. So it's just perfect timing and I think very relevant to why the seed node and some of the programs that we've developed are going to be so important. And just to remind you, they came up with a calculation, the National Academies today, saying for every $1 million that you spend on restoration, and many of us are very familiar with this, you generate 13 to 32 job years. That's full annualised job years. So it makes good business, creating carbon and at the same time creating rural and regional opportunities. And when you put indigenous communities into that, we're really cooking on gas. Since we've got Woodside here, I thought I'd use the gas metaphor, whether it's out of favour or not. Um, and in the total benefits of that one million, it's between three and 4.5 million that you can generate in total economic benefits. And that's not taking into account the social benefits of living in healthy, resilient environments. I think that's going to be showing much greater benefits in the future. Imagine the wheat belt, selenized, depleted, degraded, where people are happy to live there because their houses and their bricks in their houses aren't degrading because of Salt Creek. I own a house in the wheat belt, I have Salt Creek, I know what I'm talking about. So this is the future that we're looking at and seeds are just part, I think, of what is a very exciting journey going forward. So I'll now hand over to Simon and his team to take you on a uh, journey through your journey with seeds. Thank you, Kingsley, for this brief introduction. I apologise for the delay. We have a meeting just finishing it right now next door. So I'll try to share the screen with you so you'll be able to see my talk. Haley, can you confirm you can see the slide okay? Okay. So in this uh, workshop, as Kingsley said, I'll try to take you through a journey of the native seed supply chain. What does it mean and how it might actually affect all of you in your activity, even if you are both a seed users or a seed supplier, all these things apply to all of you in the industry. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my team. This is the people that helped me put together this workshop and helped me in the last uh, here to put all this research together. Unfortunately today, Michael and Zoe are not going to be here, but I really want to thank them for their support. So let's talk about this native seed supply chain. What do I mean with it and why is it relevant to you? So usually I like to look at it in the context of a restorative activity, of a restoration project, when we try to take a degraded ecosystem and then try to bring it back to a healthy, resilient, and resistant eco ecosystem. And usually to do so, you start with a restoration plan. And if seeds are one of your key activity, you might, you will have to prepare a seed sourcing and procurement plan, which goes through the phase of seed collection from natural population. If possible, multiply those seeds through seed production in seed farms. Then go through the steps of seed processing, quality testing, storage, dormancy alleviation, seed enhancement, and then ultimately going into the field 
the site preparation and seeding, and ideally be able to return your reference uh, ecosystem. Get this one out of the way. And this is taken from the point of view of, um, so I forgot to make this one disappear. The point of view of a native seed supplier. But what we're gonna do today is try to look at it from the point of view of a restoration practitioner. So this one I've been through already. Okay, and for a restoration practitioners, it doesn't matter what happened before it gets the seed. All the matters to him is to be able to deliver the project on time, on budget, and deliver all of the objectives. So what we're gonna see here today, how this one could be achieved, and also how the various steps of the seed supply chain can help the practitioner achieve this in a more cost-effective and timely manner. So to do so, I'm sorry, I really have to remove this one. I don't know how to get away. Hopefully it worked now. Yes. So um, to do so, we're gonna run a series of simulation on some fictional restoration projects. Um, this is an example of how this will work, and it's gonna be an activity we'll do together. You've got booklets with you, which you're gonna fill up while I'm presenting. So for example, we select a series of species and uh, we have a target of plants we want to put back in the landscape, let's say a million, uh, a million plants. Uh, we're then gonna calculate the amount of seed needed and the cost of those seeds. In this example, it's $30,000. We're gonna have like the simulation cost that takes into account the cost of a seed and then uh, the cost of the operation. So the tractor, the seeding equipment, the personnel used for it. And we'll give a total cost of restoration. Then we're gonna run a simulation, and these simulations uh, is gonna tell us how this restoration is performing compared to the target. So we're gonna have, for example, 500,000 plant. Remember that our target was a million plant, so it means that we achieved 50% of our goal, and that cost uh, of 1,000 established plant is gonna be $100 per plant. This one is exactly in the spot I don't want it to be. Maybe I'll use better. So I've decided to show you the cost of a, a thousand established plant because it's a measure of a, um, efficiency of your restoration plant. Because when you perform restoration using seeds, it doesn't matter how many kilos you put in the ground. What matters is how many plants will survive after two, three, five years. So this is our goal, plants that are successfully established. But because just to calculate the cost of a plant in some of the simulation will be lower than one cent, I decided instead to use the, cont of a, the cost of a thousand established plant as an indicator of our efficiency. Uh, but this goal doesn't tell us the entire story because we have got 50% of the total number of plant, but maybe it could be all just plant from one single species that done very well and we don't have the diversity that we actually want to, want to achieve. So I have to develop an index that takes into account how each plant is performing compared to our targets. And uh, I've created this index that goes from zero to 100. Zero being nothing came up, 100 means that everything is performing exactly as we want it to. And it takes into account the difference among all the different species. So example here, the first case, we've got mostly of the grasses established, but not as much of the shrubs and the um, tree. And so, sorry, going too fast. Go back. Okay, in this case, you see most of it is grasses. Next example, we've got just the grasses and none of the others, and you see that the index has dropped to 27. The best case scenario, we've got or much more of the other species as well, not just grasses, and the index rises. So this index up here, which will appear in all the simulation, tells you how well your diversity is performing in this scenario. Uh, on the top there, you'll see there's gonna be a page number, and this is the page on the, your booklets where that simulation is going to be presented. And that's what it looks like. So you'll have two pages, one to write notes about that specific topic that we're gonna talk about in the simulation. And then you've got, if you wanna keep track of these costs and the simulation results, fill in those two tables. So a bit of a disclaimer how the simulation work. 
And so most of it, I made it up. It's based on a series of assumptions and educated guesses. For example, species composition, I invented it. Operation cost, I've got some estimation here and there, but it's not like real life information. And also the variable of success of seed were based a bit on the literature and a bit I just invented them. Uh, another disclaimer is that this is an oversimplified simulation. Many of the variables that affect uh, seed-based restoration in the field, such as weed, land access, soil preparation, and whatnot, we did not consider in this exercise. But th those really affect uh, the performance of restoration in real life. But they're actually information that are based on real data, namely the, the cost of seed, the size of seeds, the quality, the germination, and so on. They're all based on data that we collected in the past year. And specifically, we've collected this data on a pool of 191 species, coming mostly from Perth area and uh, from the Midwest. So, that said, we can finally start the proper um, presentation. So, native seed-based restoration project. Let's take any place in the wheat belt, doesn't matter. And we have got this project, a customer asked us to restore, with biodiversity maybe for carbon planting, 2,000 hectares of the wheat belt. Uh, we want to do it properly, so we base our operation on the international standards uh, for ecological restoration. That means that to do it properly, we need to have a reference ecosystem, something that we need to aim towards and try to get the same level of diversity, complexity, and resilience of something that already exists and is healthy. We do so by checking, understanding what is our native reference ecosystem look like and what it is. In this case, we've got some remnant vegetation between all this paddock, and we can pick those if they are healthy. Otherwise, we need to go further away and look for a healthy community to use as our goal. We'll build our species composition based on, on this reference ecosystem. In this case, as I said earlier, it's gonna be oversimplified. On a real project, you probably end up with 80, 100, 150 species. Now we're just gonna limit to eight species just for the sake of this exercise. But this species has been selected to be representative of the most common families and um, life form. So we've got trees, shrubs, forbs, grasses, and annuals. I'll go quickly through all of the species. Actually, if you look, you should have at your table one of each species. Each table has got a different species. One has got Eucalyptus leptopoda, Melaleuca radula, super tiny seeds, Acacia cuminata, Atriplex amnicola, one of the saltbush, Baronia simosa, Tylotus polystachio, uh, very nice forb, and uh, this grass, Singopogum optectus, and then an annual species, uh, Anasteraceae, uh, Podofeca chrysantha. So we've set our species. Uh, now we need to decide how many plants do we want to get back for this species. So let's say our expected return is gonna be five plants per square meter, meaning that we're gonna get 50,000 plants per hectare. So for the ones of you that have done restoration, we know that's a very high number. But let's break it down by the species group. So all together, we try to get a density of about one of these shrubs and trees every, five, every two square meters. It means that we need about 5,000 trees or shrubs per hectare. While the rest of it is gonna be mostly forb, grasses, and annuals. They really give you the understory cover. So let's set up total plant target. It's gonna be a total of 100 million plants to cover these 2,000 hectares. And this is how the different species are gonna be distributing the total number of plants. The next question is, okay, we set our target, but how many seeds do we need to reach those targets? Well, it's hard to say. The first information that we need to know is how many seeds are there for ground, or really how big are those seeds, how heavy are those seeds. So this information can be found online. There are lots of databases that provide this information. Probably one of the most complete one was developed by the Millennium Seed Bank in the UK, and this is the link for that website. And they've got lots of species, even from Western Australia. We've actually calculated this ourselves. You'll see later how this can be done. And this is the information we got. We know, for example, by looking at this number, that, for example, acacia is quite big because it's got 59 seeds per gram, while melaleuca is super tiny. It's got more than 12,000 seeds per gram. Uh, however, I prefer, instead of using the seeds per gram data, the 1,000 seed weight. It's fundamentally the same data. It's present in a different way. This data means how many, uh, how heavy is 1,000 seeds 
and you see it changes among different species, the lowest, Melaleuca, being actually the smallest seed. Uh, talking of 1,000 seed weight, we using all the data on 191 species, we can now distribute what is the size range of the species that we got under consideration. And we'll see how tend to have this very nice distribution. And we've plot in here the species that we're gonna run in this exercise. You'll see how they actually fall nicely within this distribution. So the species we'll be working on the simulation more or less are in line with what we've seen is out there. Okay. Now that we know the size of the seed, uh, we need to decide how many seeds we need to get. Simple, we divide by 1,000, so we get the weight of one seed, and then we multiply it for the number of plants that we need. And this gives us a total, let's say in kilograms, of about 260 kilos to cover this entire area, which is about 130 grams per hectare. Okay, now we know how many <coughs> seeds do we need, but where do we get them from? Do we buy them from a supplier? Or will we contract a collector? We collect them ourselves? Because unfortunately, it's not that easy to get seeds. You cannot just go up farmings and buy them. Usually you need to plan it in advance. Let's say we are lucky, we manage to get a supplier to get a seed that we can get collectors. But there's something to consider when collecting native seeds. Actually, lots of things to consider. You need, when you collect them, you have to do so, try to maximize the genetic diversity of the population you're collecting. So it's just not enough go there and grab a few seeds. You need to go in different position and get, be representative. You need to collect enough seeds to do your project, but without damaging the, the population. So you shouldn't collect more than 15, 20% of the available seed. And if it's for annual species, it should be less than 10%. Don't collect from the same population every single year and if seed maturation is extended through the season, try to go at different times to encapsulate more of the diversity. And these are all the reason why native seeds are so expensive. And on top of that, if there's very little remnant vegetation left, there might not be enough seed. It means that you need to go and look around in different population, or you need to come back year after year after year to build up your seed stock that's large enough to go ahead and do your restoration. Okay, that said, let's look at the price of seed. These are the prices for these pieces that we collected from commercial suppliers. You'll see the average price is about $2,000. Now let's look how it does compared to the information we've got on our species, the 150 species we got the data for. So if you look at this, there's a few outliers, some batches that are very expensive. So we remove some of the outliers and we'll see that the average price of a seed batch is about $1,000 per kilo. Now, if you try to plot the species we've got here, you see that more or less they all fall the same distribution, apart from Boronia simosa all the way up there at $10,000 per kilo. So we'll treat that one as an outlier, so remove it from our average, and we see that now more or less the average cost of our seeds is in line with what was absorbed across all the other species. So we're more or less playing in the same field. Now that we know how much of the seeds we need to calculate, it's total cost of seed. So we just got the kilos multiplied by the cost by kilo and we got the total cost, which is about $188,000. Wonderful, so now we got our seed and we have to think how we're gonna deliver them to site. One of the most common approach is to use seed broadcasting. It can be done manually, but given the size and the scope of this project, probably we're better off using a tractor. The other factor that you remember we need to consider in the simulation is the cost of the seeding operation. So the tractor and the broadcaster cost, including renting the tractor, the seeder, the people driving it, the person uh, bringing the seeds over in the field, uh, we estimate it to be about $200 an hour. The speed of this system, we estimate it to be about five hectares a day. Assuming a 10 hours work day, it's gonna be about 40 days to complete the entire operation for a total cost of $80,000. Now that we've got this information, we can now populate our cost. Cost for seed, adding the cost for seeding operation, will give us a total of about $267,000. And now let's run the simulation. What's the result? We got 1.6 million plants, but our goal was 100 million plants. It means that we achieved 1.6% of our goal. Cost per plant for a thousand established plant is 162 bucks. And our diversity index is 0 0.7. Remember, the index goes from 0 to 100. And this is not even one. 
So something went terribly wrong in here. Yes, it wasn't their expenses, but it wasn't effective at all. So we need to change our approach. So let's look closer to what actually happened to the seeds when we put them in the ground. We now, our goal is five plants per square meter, and now we assume 100% success rate. So we think that every seeds we put into the ground will turn up into a plant. That is not necessarily what happened, because there's so many variables they are trying to do everything they possibly can to stop that from happening. Something like predation, seed removal, uh, good soil contact, temperature, drought, water availability, competition, biotic and abiotic stresses. Those are things that are in the way for our seeds to turn into an herbal plant. Let's break it down into the various stages. So how many seeds are reached the appropriate microsite? Because we've been using broadcasting, probably one out of five seeds is able to reach the appropriate microsite where it could germinate. How many seeds will germinate? Let's say 80%. How many seedlings will emerge? Well, usually in the literature, we found that emergence is uh, the real bottleneck in uh, restoration. So seeds usually tend to germinate, but then they fail when they try to push through the soil and emerge. So we'll say about 40%. And how many plants will survive for uh, one, two, or three years before we do the monitoring? We can assume it's gonna be about 50%. So if you put all of this together, you realize that putting five seeds per square meter is not gonna do it. We actually need to put 156 seeds per square meter to try to achieve this goal of five plants per square meter. If we do a conversion, it means that we need to do 30 times more to buy 30 times more the seed that we bought originally. So let's run the numbers, multiply by five all the quantity for all the species, let's get the cost, and now with more than $5 million. Run the simulation, like the simulation cost, $5.7 million altogether. Successful establishment. Okay, we're getting there. We've got 50 million plants. We are halfway there. Cost of established plants has dropped. It used to be $160, is $150 now. But still, our diversity index is just 23 out of 100. So we gotta do better than this. If you look closer at what we've done, you use seed broadcasting as a However, broadcasting has got the problem is very imprecise in delivery, and, and it's uh, performed during surface seeding. Imprecise delivery means that over time you can do over or under seeding. You might get lots of seeds in a spot, very little in another area. And the problem with surface seeding, if the seeds left on the surface might be predated, removed by wind or water, have higher surface temperature, and be a risk of desiccation when the seedlings emerge. In general, these methods might be fast, but tend to be responsible for lots of seed wastage. So instead of using broadcasting, let's try to think into precision seeding instead. This method allows uh, to control sowing depth a bit better. It can give seeds a bit of coverage and a bit of protection. It's got a fairly good sowing rate and a good um, delivery of speed. If we now look at this again, but instead of broadcasting, we use precision seeding, we can assume that four out of five seeds we put into the ground are gonna end up in the right place. Keeping all the other variables exactly the same, it means that all of a sudden, instead of using 30 times more seed, we might just use eight times more seed and save us a lot of money. Let's look at the seeding operation cost because now we're using a completely different kind of machine. Tractor and seeder, let's assume they cost the same. Speed, however, is slower because when you drive with this precision seeding, you cannot go as fast as with a broadcaster. So it's about two hectares an hour. That means that we're gonna deliver the restoration in the entire area in about 100 days and a total cost of $200,000. Now, let's uh, change the numbers. So instead of multiplying the original numbers by 30, we just do it by eight. And now the cost of seed is $1.5 million. Add the cost of the seeding operation, 1.7 million altogether. Results, well, the plan successfully established is not that different. It's a, still about 50%. But the cost per plant now is drastically dropped. We're now all the way down to $32 instead of 120. So that already on its own is a great difference in the efficiency of using the seed. Uh, our diversity index, however, is still unchanged. It's still fairly similar. Let's have a closer look on how each species is doing, because so far we just looked at the total number of plants, but not uh, at every single species. So if we go in there and start checking how the species are doing, we'll see some of them, like this Asteraceae, is doing pretty well. It's almost reached the 40,000 
that we want them to achieve. But most of them are terribly underperforming. And then I actually raise the question, are we sure that the seal we're using, that we bought or we collected, are actually alive? Because we have assumed that, but you should never assume it. And to talk about this, there's gonna be Tiana, and is gonna talk to you how seed quality test and what are the procedures needed to find out if your seeds are alive or not. So Simon showed you how many seeds you need in terms of kilograms, but when you actually look at a batch of seeds, there's usually other material in there. You've got chaff, you have sometimes little bits of twigs or leaves, um, sometimes a lot of broken seeds as well. So you might know that you need 12 kilograms of seed, but how many kilograms of a batch do you need to get to 12 kilograms of pure seed? This is where we do a seed quality test. The first step in this is working out how much is the proportion of pure seed units in your batch. So you have your native seed batch. You would take a representative sample from the batch. You do the purity test. To do that, you just separate um, all of the pure seeds from any inert material. You weigh the fractions and you get the proportions. So, for example, in a one kilogram batch, you would have 900 grams of seed and 100 grams of waste material. So to demonstrate, we have this video here. We're using eucalyptus leptopoda, that's a 100 gram bag. I'm mixing up the sample to make sure that we really get a representative. And putting out just a small sample onto the plate. Now this is a particularly poor quality batch. Once it's sped up, you can see that there's only six seeds in the entire sample. So I'm taking the weights of the fractions and writing down the information. So using this simulation with the numbers for eucalyptus leptopoda, we've done the purity test. The pure seed unit was 0.0162, inert material 0.3. That means that out of the 100 gram bag, there was only 5.2 grams of pure seed. Normally you would take a much larger sample than we did. You'd want at least 250 pure seeds so that you can calculate then the pure seed weight. Now in your booklets, right in the middle, there's actually a set of uh, performers with calculations underneath. Just have a look, you're welcome to follow along if you want to. This is using eucalyptus leptopoda. Each of you has um, a performer with the details already filled in for the species corresponding to the seeds that you have on your table. So this is the information from the quality test that we just did. Now we want to do the 50 seeds weight. We take five samples of 50 seeds each, weigh each of them. We take an average of those five samples, divide it by 50, and this gives us our thousand seed weight, which Simon mentioned earlier. For the eucalyptus leptopoda, 1,000 seeds comes to 0.79 grams. This will be important to note later, but I won't explain it just yet. And those, if you don't feel like actually calculating it, little cheat sheets so you can write the numbers down for your species if you want. I'll give you a Beautiful. So now we know how much pure seed we have, but how do we know how much of that seed is actually live? How much of it is viable for germination? We need to take it a step further 
and do a viability test. This helps us determine the percentage of seeds in the batch that can be considered live and potentially germinate. So we have our pure seed unit from the previous example. We conduct a viability test, um, calculating the difference between live seed and empty or unhealthy seed. In this case, 80%. We multiply the two numbers, divided by 100, and then we get the proportion that is pure live seed. This is the seed in your batch that has the potential to germinate. In a one kilogram batch, that means you have 720 quality seeds. So how do we do the viability test? There's a couple of traditional methods. The first one is the cut test, where you line up your seeds and you cut each of them individually to check the embryo inside. This is time consuming and it destroys the seed. You can't then return those seeds to your batch to be used in the field. Another method is the tetrazoleum test. This uh, uses tetrazoleum to stain the seed and then the pattern uh, tells us whether or not the seed is alive. This is also very time consuming, even more time consuming. Um, it destroys the seed again, and this is actually really hard to interpret on most native species because we don't have a database to tell us what the patterns are. What we suggest doing instead is an x-ray test. This is a really simple test. You can see here it's a really clear x-ray. We just count out the seeds that are viable and count out the seeds that look unhealthy, predated, underdeveloped, or empty. This is a video of one of our techs doing the seed testing. We take five samples, x-ray each of them. We mark the ones that are healthy and mark the ones that are unhealthy. In your forms, we have this section here, the viability fill, fill test. It'll be different for each of the x-rays, and we have an example of an x-ray on the tables as well. For the eucalyptus leptopoda, it actually has quite good viability. We just take the average of the filled seeds, divide it by the empty, sorry, divide it by the to total sample number, and here we have a viability of 89%. So how do we calculate this? We have our pure seed unit, 5.2% for the eucalyptus leptopoda. Viability test, 89.2%. Same calculation as before. Multiply the viable seed unit by the pure seed unit divided by 100. This gives us the proportion of pure live seeds. In the 100 gram batch that we showed you before, we have 4.64 grams of pure live seeds, seeds that have the potential to germinate. Simon, you can run the numbers again. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Tiana. I hope it's clear how seed testing could be performed. Now, we've done it on all of the species. And uh, we know that these are the percentage of the pure live seeds we've got from the different batches, ranging from a 10% from Archiplex amnicola all the way to 77% for Acacia and Polyphica chrysantha. That means that when we put the seeds out there in the previous simulation, we just expected all of the seeds to be seeds and alive. Well, it's not true. Uh, and our average in this batch is about 20%. It's, it's fairly low. Let's see how it compares to all of the other species that we tested before on 191 species. You see here the average is about 56%. So the average of the species you're working on right now is lower than average. So we're pretty unlucky with the species we picked. And this is how our species um, uh, are presented across the distribution on, on species type. And we see that Archiplex amnicola, for example, is much lower than the average of shrubs. Uh, while eucalyptus and melaleuca, even though they appear to be lower in the group of trees, uh, are actually very common, especially for the mutacee, 
to have uh, low seed viability and especially low seed purity. So we'll expect most of the eucalyptus and Meloca to seed in this area. So that's it, let's move on. And because we know what the pure life seed percentage, we now need to adjust the quantity of seeds we need to take into consideration the lack of viability. It's simply done by dividing 100 by the pure life seeds, and it gives us like the adjustment rate. How many more times seeds do we need to buy to compensate for that? And it goes for a 30% increase for Pulvifica to a tenfold increase for Atriplex and Nicola. We have already done the calculation for you, so we now know that we need five tons of seed. Total cost now, it goes up to $3 million. On top of that, we need to think that seed testing is not free. So if you had it done from a commercial supplier, they'll ask you something between $100 and $200. So let's add that price. So it's about $2,000 more on the, entire, um, uh, on the entire cost. Okay, Tristan thinks he can do better. Okay. Hi, I'm Tristan Campbell. I'm a um, uh, data and special scientist with, with the group. And um, I, someone came to me and said, is there a better way to do this? And I said, yes, we can. So I've been playing around with uh, using various uh, image algorithms on the, on the x-rays. And the third stage you have is uh, it means you can uh, put a bunch of seeds on the tray and come back. So uh, rather than having to go through uh, manually counting out 50 seeds uh, and do that five times, weigh the seeds, and then uh, x-ray them individually, count them individually, and then classify them individually, this goes through and counts a tray of seeds, uh, finds the outlines, goes through, and then you can currently uh, interactively adjust the uh, parameters and go through and then classify as viable and non-viable. This uh, reduces the time frame required to go from the manual seed viability process from maybe half an hour an hour uh, down to about 10 minutes. And if you're looking at obviously this, this example for this site was about uh, 10 species, whereas in a, uh, a full biodiverse re restoration program, you might have you know, 100 plus species. This can give you much higher confidence in your, uh, in your viability and quality. And we are also working backwards from the process. So this is looking at viability, we're starting to look also at using the uh, X-ray attenuation factors to then uh, look at seed density to then alleviate your seed weighing requirements. And because you're looking at a higher number of sample points in terms of seed numbers, you're going to get a better representation of your overall sample quality um, and therefore your batch quality compared to doing small numbers of hand samples as well. Thank you, Tristan. So, all right, thanks to Tristan Softer. We can now do our testing much faster, and I would imagine cheaper. How much would you say? Oh, for you? Yeah. 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Perfect. 20 bucks. So that means we can save a couple thousand dollars. Doesn't look like a big deal, but as Tristan said, because it's a simplified example, we just got six pieces and all of the same batch. But if you think you collected from different places, maybe got the seeds from different sources, and you've got 100 species, that cost becomes very significant. And be able to cut it by tenfold is a big difference from like making seed testing a standard in the industry from now that is used is treated like a premium. Okay, we're ready now to run the simulation. So we said the cost of seeds three million dollars, two hundred thousand for operation, three point two million altogether. Run simulation, and wow, we're getting there. We now got eighty-eight million plants established. It means we're eighty-eight percent of the way. And the cost per 1,000 established plant has gone up a bit. We used to be 32 before, we're now up to 37. And that's probably when we did the adjustment. We did the adjustment adding, species, adding number of seeds of species that are more expensive. In terms of the diversity index, that also improved. They were now up to 47, but we're still not there quite yet. So that's something else that we need to consider. So now let's look how each of these species is doing. Uh, comparing to the number of pure life seed used. We now know how many viable seeds are in the batch because we just calculated. So these are the number of pure life seed that we put in the ground. And this is what we've got in return, so we can actually calculate the percentage of success for each species. Some are fairly good, like 16%, but some are terrible. Look at these four species, 0.5%, 3.7, 0.5%, 0.5%. 
5.4. In one case, nothing at all. So we know we are putting there pure life seed, but they're just not coming up. Why? Are we sure that the pure life seeds are able to germinate? And that's a question I want to ask to Shane Turner, our seed dormancy specialist. Thank you very much for that, Simon. This one. Okay, so what is seed dormancy? Um, seed dormancy is the inability of a seed to germinate when provided with all the necessary conditions to promote germination, such as the right temperature, moisture, and perhaps a germination stimulant like um, smoke or ethylene. Um, and we find that about 70% of Australian species would have some form of seed dormancy present as such. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for that, Simon. Um, and we recognise um, five different classes of seed dormancy as such, but the two main ones that we're really worried about are physical seed dormancy and physiological dormancy. Um, typically, geosporous species, and what I mean by that are the species that produce seeds and at maturity releases in the soil. <laughs> Take two. Um, these typically release the seeds upon maturity in the soil seed bank um, and they typically have uh, dormancy. In comparison, bradysporous species uh, tend to have non-dormant seed. And bradysporous species are species that retain their seeds on the um, uh, parental plant, if you like, such as banksias, eucalyptus, metalleucas, alocasurina as such. And these tend to be really easy to germinate. Um, and seed dormancy seems to be more common in extreme environments, such as arid, semi-arid environments, or Mediterranean type of environments as well. Uh, and it certainly seems to be more prevalent in smaller understory species rather than the, the overstory trees and things like that. So for our demonstration species, when we actually look at um, the initial germination water permeability, which is an indication of whether they have a physical uh, barrier to uh, water uptake and embryo attributes, we find that uh, three of our species we would classify as non-dormant, uh, simply because they germinate really readily to a very high percentage. Uh, we find that one out of our eight species cannot imbibe water at all, um, so we uh, conclude that it has physical seed dormancy. All eight of our species have a large, well-developed embryos, so we don't have an embryo maturation or developmental issue to deal with as such. And uh, the result of all that is that uh, four of our species have uh, physiological dormancy um, that we need to think about sort of breaking. So in regards to physical seed dormancy, um, that occurs in about 18 different uh, families worldwide in Australia. It's probably about 25 to 30% of our flora would perhaps have uh, physical seed dormancy. The common way to uh, break physical seed dormancy is the use of hot water, but we can also use scarification, nicking, acid treatment as well to uh, alleviate dormancy. But the, the go-to method really is um, hot water as such. And we typically apply that for about 30 seconds up to two minutes. But um, surprisingly, well, not that surprising when you think about it, um, quite a few of our species don't actually respond to hot water very well at all. Um, in some cases, it will not work whatsoever with the seed still alive. In other cases, it will actually kill the seed before it actually um, promotes germination as such. And a good example of that is the Australian Boab, um, Adansone gregorii. Um, these have classic physically dormant seeds. Um, if you try germinating with that in pre-treatment, you won't get any germination at all. Uh, if you nick the seeds, you'll get about 90% germination, yet if you expose them to hot water, um, you'll get some germination, maybe 20% or so. Um, but if you expose them longer than a minute, um, the germination quickly declines. But when you look at the seeds, you find that the ones that haven't germinated in that case have actually lost dormancy, but the process of giving them hot water has actually killed them as such. But luckily for us, the acacia cuminata seeds of our demonstration species um, germinate really well when you expose them to hot water for two minutes. So we go from about 3% germination uh, in our control seeds that haven't been treated up to about 77% germination after hot water exposure. Um, flipping across to physical, uh, phys physiological uh, seed dormancy, uh, four of our demonstration species had that. In fact, that's the most common type of dormancy you find both worldwide and in Australia. Um, unlike physical seed dormancy, water uptake is not actually a limiting factor. So water gets into these seeds, but um, they won't germinate simply to have a low growth potential simply due to a metabolic block 
within the embryo uh, as such. Uh, these also have fully formed embryos, um, such as this one here in the image. Um, and once you do break dormancy, they tend most of the time to germinate quite rapidly. And just as an example here, I've got a time series sequence of Personia, Longifolia, germination over a week or so. Uh, these seeds actually had dormancy broken through um, a wetting and drying process. Uh, and once dormancy was gone, they germinated no problems at all. Um, physiological dormancy is typically found in Asteraceae, um, Poaceae, so your daisies and your grasses, and salt bushes as well too, but it's found in a heap of other different uh, groups too. And treatments um, commonly used to overcome physiological dormancy include after ripening, so it's warm, dry storage, dry heat, so high temperatures for a shorter period of time, stratification, which is basically moist incubation of seeds either at cooler temperatures or warmer temperatures for a period of time, maybe a couple of weeks, and changing them to a a perfect incubation temperature to promote the germination process. Wetting and drying cycles, um, which seems to be quite important for our more problematic species, such as Pisunia, herbertias. Uh, and in a more invasive way, we can get some of these things to germinate through the use of gibberellic acid, um, nicking, um, which is very time consuming, as well as manual seed extraction, which I'm going to flip across now and describe. So for three of our four species, um, demonstration species, these seeds are actually released in florets, which is the dispersal mechanism as such, which is actually quite common. Um, so grasses do this all the time, and likewise, Thai lotus does as well. But there's a heap of other examples too in our flora. Um, typically what happens is that the seeds are sealed within the floret, uh, and until physiological dormancy is overcome, the seeds won't germinate. Um, so a good example here that I've got up is a triodia um, species. So you've got the floret, which is what's released in the soil seed bank, and you can see here, when it's been dissected through the middle, you can see where the seed sits in the, right in the middle, and when you take it out, those seeds will germinate quite easily as such once they've been liberated from that environment. Or you can break dormancy through after ripening or something like that, which may take several months to, um, to resolve the dormancy uh, block. Um, so as a way to cheat of sorts, we can actually um, manually extract these seeds using a rubber mat in a laboratory situation or for small batches or we can sort of upscale and use some sort of mechanical uh, thrasher of some sort, as long as we know what we're doing, we don't sort of uh, damage the seed in the process. Uh, as well, we find that uh, for some of these things too, you can actually expose them to um, acid for several minutes, which starts to degrade the, the floret uh, and liberate the seed or weaken it enough for the seed to actually push through as part of um, the germination process. Uh, and for three of our four species with physiological dormancy that have forest, uh, dispersed seeds, you can see from the graphs here that uh, we go from about 9% germination up to 91% germination in our atroplex after liberating the seeds through use of a rubber mat. For our Simbopogon obtectus, we go from about 64% up to 77% germination, again by using a rubber mat to liberate the seeds, which is not much of an improvement, but nevertheless it's still a bit of an improvement. And for our Thai Lotus, we go from about 34% germination in our control, seeds slash florets up to 78% with the use of a rubber mat. But interestingly enough, we can actually get quite a good result after five minutes exposure to concentrated acid too, um, which in some respects is probably maybe a little easier to do um, as such. Now, the other thing I want to touch upon with physiological dormancy, we actually have a heap of species that we refer to as having intractable uh, dormancy. And these are species with multi-layered dormancy and, and relatively complex germination requirements. And they account for about potentially up to 30% of our species. Uh, and this table here sort of captures some of those more problematic families that um, we commonly encounter that have uh, species with intractable dormancy. Um, just bear in mind that all the, not all the species actually found within these families will have intractable dormancy. But certainly these families seem to crop up consistently as ones that uh, cause people quite a few problems when it comes to germination, including the Rutaceae as well, which is our last species on our list that have uh, physiological dormancy. Um, and to really note out what's going on, typically what we do is um, implement a you know, series of laboratory and field-based experiments just to see if we can figure out what's going on. And once we understand what's going on, we can actually apply that in a nursery situation. So for our Baronia samosa seeds, um, this is some work from one of our PhD students, Michael Just. He's taken seeds um, and under uh, nursery conditions, buried them for several months over summer to um, uh, soil store them and then hit them with uh, heat, a short bolts of heat and or smoke. And through that treatment, he's got about 10% germination in a nursery environment. 
Um, as well, in the laboratory uh, situation, he's been able to, after ripened seeds, so warm, dry storage for several months, remove the seeds from that, hit them with heat, and then um, smoke and combinations thereof, and improve germination from zero up to 15%. So the take-home message is, for this species in particular, a number of these treatments seem to be interacting to promote germination as such. So going back to our table, we basically go from um, prior to us looking at dormancy and considering that from about 51% germination on average right across our eight species, and we can take that up to 81% once we've taken on board dormancy and figured out the types of treatments we need to apply to overcome that. And uh, that's it. Over to Simon again. Okay, thank you, Shane. Now, Shane has shown us what dormancy <coughs> breaking treatment can do in terms of germination, and that's good to do it in a lab setting, but we've got like 200 kilos to process, you cannot do it with a scalper. So we need to find solution and ways to break that dormancy at a larger scale. And that goes through the seed processing uh, phase of the supply chain, which does both the increase of purity of seeds and also can break the dormancy. Uh, I left Tiana to talk to you more about the seed processing, cleaning and extraction process. So we'll first start off with seed sorting. This is really good for species that have a lot of extra non-seed material within the batch. Sieving means separating non-seed material that is larger and or smaller than the seed. We usually do this step first, followed up by air separation, which uses air pressure to separate any material that is lighter or heavier than the seed. So this is another video demonstration using, again, the eucalyptus leptopoda. This time we're processing the entire batch. So we've got two separate sieve sizes, one larger and one smaller than the seed. We pour the entire batch in. It takes a few seconds, but the seeds and smaller materials go down. We remove the larger material. And in the middle, you have the seeds. In the bottom, that's waste material, non-seed. Um, occasionally, there will be underdeveloped seeds that won't germinate at the bottom as well. So we put it through the air separator. Sometimes we'll use a sample to get a predefined um, air pressure so that we can run through it a lot faster. So the seeds are here down the bottom. Lighter material goes to the top. If you have a seed batch that has a lot of rocks and sand, you can actually use the air pressure to lift the seeds up and leave the rocks in the bottom. So here is the small waste. This is what went up to the top of the air separator, and this is our high quality seed. Now this is normally the point at which a seed processing facility would do the quality test. They would remove the waste, they would do a quality test on the high quality material because there will still be some non-seed material left behind. They will also do a seed test on the low quality material because the air separation does occasionally um, remove some germinable seeds as well. What can be done here is the low quality seed can be sold at a cheap price to someone who just needs to tick a box at the lowest possible price and this high quality seed can be reserved for people who actually want to do proper restoration. What I failed to mention before as well is the X-ray that Tristan's um, algorithm can do so quickly now, that doesn't damage the seed in any way. So if you need to do a large amount of testing, you can then take that seed that you tested, return it to the batch, and it's just as usable as the rest of the seed. So obviously we were using it in a very small scale in the lab, we were just using handheld sieves and a very small air separator, but this can be scaled up. There is agricultural equipment already available to use um, for large batches of seeds, and in this case an absolutely massive one in a warehouse in Germany that's used for native grasses. Following on from that, seed extraction is used on 
um, seeds that have physical dormancy, sorry, physiological dormancy, as Shane mentioned before. It can be done at a very small scale using rubber gloves or a rubber mat, or it can be done in a machine. This is a small scale field um, seed extraction, seed extractor, thresher. That's Simon putting in a batch. Sorry, how heavy is the batch? So that's 150 grams. That's what's come out of the thresher. And now he's sieving all of that material, those little brown dots, that's the seed. We put it in the air separator again. And we're left with extracted, high quality, cleaned seed. So we see all of the waste material coming across here. That's what went through the air separator. And this, we have 18 grams remaining. For some seeds, threshing isn't that effective or it can damage the seed. In this case, we recommend acid di digestion. Again, as Shane mentioned before, we use sulfuric acid. We let it sit usually for about two minutes for most species. We rinse it off with a basic um, solution and then water, and then we dry the seed. This is an example where only a very small amount of acid is added, and in less than two minutes, the amount of seed that you have left over is a lot smaller, a lot more dense. So let's have a look at those species again that Shane was showing us before. We've got here the Atroplex amnicola. That's the seed after it's been cleaned. As Shane mentioned, the control when it hasn't had any treatment done, really low germination, less than 1%. With the rubber, it's over 90% germinable. Acid and rubber is really close, but in this particular case, there's no need to go that extra step of using acid. It's an extra cost and extra time when using the rubber, using threshing works just as well, if not a little bit better. So here, we recommend threshing. For the Tylotus polystachius, again, control not great, 35%. Acid and rubber was the best result at 85% germination in our trial. But again, you'd think, why would I go that extra step to use acid when I could just use the rubber instead? It gives a really close result. What we found was that Tylotus polystachius, um, it's quite a brittle seed. So excessive threshing can actually break the seed. Obviously, we used whole healthy seeds to do this trial, but there was a lot of broken seed left over. What the acid does is it actually softens the florets so that threshing can be done much more easily, much more gently, and the seeds can be extracted without breaking them. So we recommend acid and threshing. Finally, Simbopogon obtectus. What we found here was acid kills the seed. Um, there was no germination, I'm oh, sorry, there was one seed that germinated out of the entire trial. Um, so there's no point using acid whatsoever, just avoid it completely. You want to use rubber, it is a little bit better germination than without, um, without cleaning the seed whatsoever. Simon? Thank you, Tiana. So the last one on the single pogon of Tectus would come uh, as a bit of a surprise to me because uh, through my PhD, I've done lots of testing on grasses and acid was usually the best treatment and really improved germination and the processing time. But that comes to show like how we cannot assume that all the species will behave the same just because they belong to the same family. So at times it's necessary to do some more testing and to see how different species will behave to the different treatments. <coughs> so, now that, thank you to Tiana, we know, and Shane, we know what needs to be done to the seed. Let's try to do it at scale, and let's see what process do we need and how much this processing would cost. So let's assume these are the prices for every kilo of seed that gets processed for dormancy breaking or for cleaning. 
And we now have a total cost of uh, multiplied by the number of kilos, and we've got the total cost of how much we have to pay to do the processing. In this case, about $125,000, which is 4% of the total cost of seed. But someone might ask, why should I spend all this money to clean my seeds when most of them actually are doing fine the way they are? That brings me to another topic that we haven't touched on yet, which is seed storage. Because as I mentioned earlier, if you're not going to do your restoration straight away, but you're going to wait a few years to get enough seed to start, you need to put the seed in storage somewhere that you know they can maintain the viability. And maintaining viability over time is key for storage. Not all seeds can be stored. Uh, they need to be orthodox. Orthodox means they can be dried and they can stay alive when dried. Some species are called recalcitrant. If you dry them, you kill them. So those ones you need to use straight away. Luckily for us, all of the species are most likely orthodox, and most of the species in Western Australia are orthodox. So usually it's not an issue here. I want to show you this graph. This was a study done a few years ago of some European species. And you can see, by keeping those seeds at a controlled humidity and temperature ambient, and humidity is the key, 15% relative humidity, it means that you can maintain the viability of seeds over time. But if you allow the humidity to go higher, about 50%, and which is more or less ambient condition, even if you cool them, for example, at zero degrees, the viability will drop drastically. In this example, after two years, we've lost 50% of the viability of our seeds. But to store seeds properly with uh, a low humidity condition, you need to build proper storage. And it needs to be isolated, and it needs to be dehumidifier, and there's a cost connected to building it and running it. So the question is, is this worth building or renting one of these units to store your seed? Well, let's run the numbers. This is our cost of seed, $3 million. Let's store them for two years. Then we know they'll lose 50% of the viability over these two years. All of a sudden, we've lost one and a half million dollars of seed that have lost the viability over these two years. That means that we're losing $2,000 a day because we are not storing seeds correctly. So seed storage is so important that I cannot stress out enough we need to build those units. And they're not that expensive. I was talking yesterday to a guy in Victoria that is doing seed production. He just bought a few days ago like a seed storage unit of about 30 square meter, and he paid about $25,000. So pretty much in two weeks, it pays for itself if you've got this amount of seed with restoring. So doing it properly is fundamental for the entire seed supply chain because usually this is one of the major bottlenecks, at least here in Australia. And now it brings me to the point I wanted to make about why it's important to do processing. Let's take one of the example seeds. This one here, it's uh, Artriplex amnicola. So, I'm Nicola, you see what the seeds look like before it's cleaned and after it's cleaned. The density for the first unclean seeds is about 0.2 kilograms per liter. Once it's cleaned, it's 0.7. So it's already higher density. But let's look at the total weight, the bulk weight of the seeds. And that's exactly for the same number of pure life seed. And the original batch is about 650 kilos. Once it's cleaned, it's 25 kilos. Because remember, just one out of 10 of these is, is got a seed in. In terms of volume, you just simply multiply <coughs> the density for the weight and we get the volume is about 3,000 liters in the first case, 35 liters in the second case. Still exactly the same number of pure less seed, meaning that the first one, you fill entirely every space of this compact car. The second one, you can put it in a backpack. And as I said, exact same number of pure less seed. So the difference here is like having a garage and having a shelf. And if you think of a storage unit, every square meter in there is a cost. So instead of parking a car, you can use a backpack, and it's exactly the same amount of seed. So that's the economic reason why seed processing is important, to cut down the cost for storage. And this is an example across the various species, because actually Nicola is a bit of an extreme, but also for the Melaleuca, the eucalyptus, the one you see before, you know, a 5% of those bag of 100 seed is viable, so you don't need to store all the chaff, just store the proper seed, and you, you, and you can get them out when you need them. Uh, however, as I said, there's a reason, though, for continuing doing research on, <coughs> on storage, because we're now based on assumption from studying European species. It'd be better to know more about our own species, how they behave. 
although most of them are orthodox, some of them are not. And this is a great example here. It's a macrosemia. Zemia is a very uh, emblematic species in the southwest. And the seeds are huge. They come in this fruit. That's what it looks like. And that's the seed in, inside is a shell. And that's the clean seed. When we collect them fresh and put them through the x-ray, that's what they look like. That's what they look like after a year and that's after two years. And you see the star shrinking and cracking. And that's the usual behavior of a recalcitrant seed. You cannot dry them. You cannot store them because they'll die very quickly. So the message here is no point collecting them and storing them. You're just taking huge space of your storage for something that's probably dead. So once you collect it, do it targeted and do it just before you're going to use them because otherwise you're going to lose all of your money for collecting them. Uh, there's so many more information about this fascinating species and Shane is doing some wonderful study on it. So if you're interested, get in touch with Shane and he'll share more of his uh, information. Now, <clears throat> close that parenthesis, let go back on the seed processing. So we estimated that the cost for processing is $125,000. Let's add that up to the total cost of seed, get the total cost adding the seeding operation and run our simulation. And all of a sudden, boom, we've gone beyond. Now we've got 110 million plants out of the 100 million that was our target. So we achieve 110% of success. The cost of established plant is still around $30, $31. And uh, our diversity index is about 75. So we are there. We are getting there. We're getting very close to our target. But there's something that we still need to do to improve the diversity index and probably even reduce cost because we don't need to get to 110%. All we need to do is try to reach the 100% goal. So if you look how each plant is doing, we can see that some of them are overachieving, eucalyptus and melaleuca. Some are still underachieving. For example, the bronia. And some, like Podofica, is terribly overachieving, like 10 million plants. This is the number of pure seed that we use, and this is the percentage of success. Boronia, as we've seen earlier from Shane, still managed to germinate at 15% at the best of our knowledge and capacity now to break its dormancy. So probably there's no point, like if you look at the cost of a thousand plant here among the different species, they're all between like $5 to $50. This one is up to $700 for a thousand plant. It's so much higher than the others because the seeds are so expensive and they germinate poorly. So it's pointless try to throw seeds in the ground and expect it to come. Eventually it will, but it's probably not worth it. So instead, let's drop the number of plants here to just 400,000 so we're almost there and maybe distribute across the other species to compensate for the difference in number in the shrubs and trees. Hopefully, the customer will understand why we have to make this modification. And instead of wasting all this money on seeds, they're probably not they're going to die. You can instead invest those money to do some more research to understand how to break it better or to buy green stock. So instead of putting the seed, put the plant that was already growing in a nursery and you're sure that that one's going to work. So let's change a bit the target and then adjust the quantity to finally try to reach our goal, multiplying by the different factors. The cost now goes down to $3 million, altogether 3.3 million, and run the simulation, and we're finally there. We've got 100% of the target. The cost has gone up a bit to about $33 for a thousand established plant, but the diversity index now is finally at 100. So we did it. We finally managed to achieve our goals. Whatever we're going to do from now on is going to be mostly to decrease the cost of a thousand seed plants and increase the efficiency of restoration. But before I move on on how to decrease the cost of the entire operation, I want to open a parenthesis about the cost of seeds and especially how we are selling and buying seeds right now. If you see here and throughout the presentation and pretty much everywhere, everybody talks about price per kilo or price per gram. But there's a fundamental flaw in these methods and it is that if the buyer itself is just interested in the seed price, but doesn't take into account how the uh, variables that we talked about, a seed supplier doesn't have the incentive to do the quality test, to store them properly, to clean its seeds, because all the customer wants is price. I, why I, as a supplier, should tell them, oh, just 50% of the seeds are viable, or clean it up, because the price is always considered by kilo. It's a not very transparent way of talking about seed price. 
as I said, seed price doesn't take into account any of the seed size and weight, nor anything about seed quality. And I like to remind you over and over again that the final outcome of a restoration project is how many plants you've got established at the end, not how many seeds you've put in the ground. To do so, we're suggesting these new methods for selling native seeds. Instead of talking of dollars per kilo, let's start talking about dollars for a thousand pure life seed. Because we've already done all the analysis in the testing, we know exactly what the quality of the seed is, we know exactly what the size is, and it's very easy to calculate. So in this case, we've got pure life seed 72%, and we know that the weight for a thousand pure seed unit is five grams. Let's divide this one by the second, and we go about seven gram for a thousand pure life seed. Because we know the price per kilo, we know also what the price per gram is, about one dollar per gram. We just multiply the price by the pure life seed, and we can get the cost of a thousand pure life seed. In this case, five dollars and fifty-four cents. You see now, using this system, instead of using the dollar per kilo, all the information are conveyed in here. So as a seed user, I don't have to worry about, oh, uh, what is the viability test results? What is the thousand seed unit? Like, I've got it all there. When I plan my restoration and the cost for restoration, I can usually get the number and put it in my spreadsheet and make everything much easier. You don't have to go through what I've ever shown here today. You just use that information for your project. And uh, of course, we try to do this on all the species we got prices for. And this is on average what the price of a thousand pure life seed will look like. On average, about $6.7, and it differs among different life forms, with shrubs to be about $7, and the forbs $7, and annual be the seed about $3. Look at the now species, they will all, all more or less fall in line with this distribution, apart from Boronia, no surprise, is all the way up there with $17. Uh, an interesting information here that I don't have on this graph. But when we look at the um, Fabaceae, at the Acacias, they usually consider the cheapest one by kilo because you pay between 100, 200, 200 dollars a kilo. When you put them up here, the average price goes all the way up to eight to 10 dollars, which is much higher than all the rest that usually we consider to be more expensive. And that's because they don't take into account the quality and they don't take into account the size. Okay, that said, close parenthesis, and let's continue with our simulation. So how can we improve efficiency of seeding? So far, we've been running all our simulation using these methods, so using a two-row seeder of a seed mix. Our idea now is to move away and to scale it up and speed up the process and use something like an agricultural uh, equipment, like a canola seeder that Kingsley mentioned before, to deliver it at a much larger scale and hopefully drop the price. However, right now we cannot do it yet because you've seen how complex and diverse the structures of the seeds are, and that's why we are currently using that sort of seeder, because you have to mix them all with inert material and try to use the two row to kind of deliver as precisely as you can. You cannot put them all for a canola seeder. They're all too different. They won't mix, they won't get, they, they will get blocked into the delivery system. We've cleaned all of the seeds, as you've seen earlier, and that means that the seeds are now, once they're clean, seed in this size range, they are much smaller and much lighter. But to go for a canola seeder, we need to make them the size of a canola seed, which seeds inside uh, this group. But not just them, also the other smaller seed, like the Pogofica, the Mevaluca, the Eucalyptus, also need to reach that size, which is more or less, as you see here, this is the size of a canola seed compared to our native seeds. So take them all the way there, and seed all together into this group. And to do so, we use seed enhancement technology. And namely, in the what we, we need to use is seed coating. Seed coating, very simply put, is just the art of putting stuff around the seed. There are different kind of coating. Film coating is just a very light film of material around the seed. You've got encrusting. When you cover them up a bit more, but you can still see the shape of the seed. When you turn them into a little sphere and you can no longer see the original shape, then it's called pelleting. This has been done in agriculture for more than a century. Uh, one of his main role of this technology is to modify and standardize the weight, the size, and the properties, physical properties of the seed. So it's standardized, easy to go through the logistic, easier to deliver and improve the flowability and the ballistic. 
In our case, we are going to do pelleting because we've got very tiny seeds and we're going to build them up to the size of a canola seed. Uh, there are different kind of equipment that can be used. The one I think is better for most native seed is probably the rotating pan. And in this short video, I'll show you how I've done it on this species of salt bush. So this is what our small pan looks like. Uh, we alternate delivering a powdery material with a glue. We add a second layer with talc and some color to tell them apart with different treatments. And that's what they look like at the end of the process. You see how different is the shape and the size of these seeds. And you actually have a, at your table, probably was in your bag, this little uh, business card. And there's an example here of non-pelleted and pelleted seed of an Igozanthus manglesii. So there's another example. Like this is uh, Navimelaluca. This is from the Perth area. In this vial, there's exactly 2,000 seed. And that's the difference in volume between the one that were not coated and the one that are coated. Uh, we've tested germination on most species, and we found out that usually there's not much difference in germination. That means that even though we add stuff to seed, they're still able to germinate. Continuing the simulation, we've done it, and let's calculate the cost of the pelleting, how much it would cost. You see it's much higher per kilo, for example, in the Melaleuca, because it's so smaller that you really need to add lots of material and you take a long time to develop it, while for larger seed, it's probably not going to be as expensive. Multiply by the number of kilos, and we got a total cost for how it will be to pellet all these pieces to get them to the right size. And we've got about $172,000, which is more or less 5% of the total cost of seed. Let's look into the seeding operation cost, because we are no longer using a small tractor with a two-row seeder. We probably need to move on to a much larger tractor and a much larger canola seeder. Let's say the cost of the tractor is going to go up to $300 an hour from the $200 we had before. However, the speed is going to be much higher because it's so large it can actually cover 10 hectares an hour instead of two. That means they will be able to finish the entire seeding operation in 20 days instead of the 100 we had before. And that brings the total cost to $60,000. So just by being able to use this machine and increasing the size of seed, we are already saving something like $140,000 in the operation itself. But let's look at the big picture, how it's all coming together when we do the pelleting in the simulation. So total cost, 3.3 million. Simulation success, oh, we're still up 112%. So instead of looking at this, let's adjust the species number to accommodate for that. That means that we'll need less seeds and it's gonna be cheaper. 2.9 million dollars, 60,000. So we're below $3 million in total cost. Run the simulation, we go 100%, and the cost for a thousand established plant dropped to $30. Success still at 99 for the diversity, which is, yeah, a bit of a cost saving, but is it worth going through all the pain and hassle to do all the pelleting and not? Well, the answer is probably yes. And I want to show you this real life example of an experiment that we ran last year in collaboration with Greening Australia. So, what we've done, I was given seven species of uh, native um, mutaceae, true eucalyptus and fine melaleuca. I've run all of my usual process of seed testing, processing, and pelleting. Going from here to here to here. And then we want to test seedling emergence and survival in the field using both manual seeding of different species to see how they work, and then mechanical seeding uh, using their seeder. Uh, Having all the information about the viability allow me to calculate how many seeds are where they put in the ground using the, the rate. So I calculated that on, on average the, there's almost half a million seeds that gets delivered, pure life seeds that are delivered per hectare. And I had to match that quantity for my pelleted seed to make sure we were comparing like to like. We went to this site, Pingrap, in the wheat belt. We do the hand seeding. And then we mix our seeds with vermiculite and run it through the canola cedar. And you can see here the little pelleted seed in the soil along with the vermiculite. Then we went back in November last year to check how this experiment was going. And we found out that out of a seven, almost 7,000 pure life seed we seeded in the hand trial, eight seedlings were alive, regardless of treatment. And we look at the quadrats, the results. So for about half a million seeds that were put in the ground per hectare, 
700 seedlings on average were alive. So something there went terribly wrong, regardless of the treatment. Luckily, we've put these probes in the ground. We have a probe that can measure the temperature, but most importantly, the moisture in the soil at different depths. So one centimeters, five, 10, and 20. And this is what those results look like. Don't worry about the temperature, but let's look instead at the moisture content. And we can see that between September and November, there were very little uh, rain. So the, um, the moisture content in the soil dropped drastically. And if you look closer, between the 7th of September and the 31st of October, the, the humidity in the soil dropped drastically, especially at the one and five centimeters. So it was bone dry next to the surface. But if you look at 10 and 20 centimeters, there was still lots of moisture available throughout all this drought period, apart at 10 in the last few days. But still, there's an indicator of why things have died, because our seeds probably didn't have enough time to grow radical to, to reach the subsoil moisture. So by staying in this, in this um, more surface area, they just couldn't get the water, and that's why they died. If we compare the results of our June seeding with what we can see was seeded earlier in June, from July to June, we see that there is something alive there. You can see the melaleuca, you can see the acacia, you can see uh, the eucalyptus. So what we learned from this experiment was that later the seeding, the higher is the risk of mortality because you enter the risk area when there's gonna be no snow in late winter and early spring when you can lose all of your seed. And the lesson here is that we need to concentrate the seeding as early as we can when we get the first rain and try to get them out there as quickly as possible. Right now, as you seen earlier, with our model, if you have to do 2,000 hectares, you have to do it across 100 days. That means that you go two months inside the danger zone of losing those seeds for, for those early droughts. But if you can do the canola seeder, it means that we can concentrate all of the seeding in 20 days and do it all at the beginning of winter. So we leave the seed enough time to germinate and to start growing and to grow deep enough fruit to be able to reach the subsoil moisture if drought arrives. So we have not taken this into account in the simulation, but it's something that you need to think about, that the timing is fundamental and you need to get it right if you wanna have higher chances of success. <clears throat> Moving on, so far we've talked to pelleting it's just as a way to increase the size of seed and make it possible to be delivered through agricultural equipment. But there's more that we can do with pellets, which is add some extra compound that can help the seed and the plant to germinate, emerge, and survive. That's one of the main reasons this technology has been developed in agriculture. They use lots of pesticide, insecticide, protectants, and so on. And we might try to start looking at some of those solutions to improve the survival of our seeds. Um, if we look how which species are doing, compared to the number of pure life seed use, we now know that on average our chances of success is about 14%. If we look at the um, demographic process of those seeds in the ground, we've been using a canola seeder, these are the number we've got. And we've already worked a lot on these two, using a canola seeder increase the precision, germination is now achieved at 80% thanks to dormancy breaking and processing, but we can still work on these two aspects, seedling emergence and plant survival. For example, by using some protectants on the seed to stop predators from eating them, or hydrogel, surfactant agents, and other things that might be customized depending on the site, you can potentially improve the seedling emergence, let's say from 40 to 50%, just by 10%. And then you can also work on improving plant survival. An example is by using salicylic acid, which is the natural compound uh, of aspirin. By doing that, you can probably improve between five to 10% the survival of those plants. And this number is actually a, a true data that we collected through during my PhD, where we tested seed coating with salicylic acid on tree grass species. And we see that on average, it can improve between four, five to 11% the survival of plants one year after seeding because they've received salicylic acid. Uh, this one was published a few days ago and um, and that's just one example of the stuff that we can use to improve the success of seed and restoration. So now let's run the simulation. Let's say that we've improved a bit the emergence and uh, survival using some good stuff. And that now brings down the cost because we'll need to use less seed to $2 million all the way from $3 million. Adding the operation cost altogether is about $2 million. 
Success, we know, is now 100%, but the cost for a 1,000 established plant now has dropped to 20 from 30, and that's a massive improvement. And if you look again how each species is doing after doing the treatments, we, need the, we see that now our success rate has gone up from 14% to 21%. There's still room for improvement, but all of a sudden, it's much cheaper to do it, and it's becoming way more effective. And that's just the beginning of a journey because there's so much else we can do and we can evaluate. Some example, we can start try to put smoke water into the, the coating so we can maybe broke some of the dormancy and, and promote germination of seed. Another thing that would be very nice to test in the future is adding beneficial microbes, symbiontic microbes that can work with the seeds and emerging radical to develop an healthy plant. These are all research questions that need to be explored in the future and could optionally bring up the success, the success rate even higher than the 20% we've got in this simulation. But now let's take a completely different approach. If you want to drop cost, that's a, a way, but another alternative is to look at the cost of the seeds themselves. So if you look here, especially on these three species, Forbes, grasses, and annual, which are the biggest part in terms of cost of our, uh, of our project, the cost per kilo is quite high, 320 all the way to $2,000 per kilo of the species. And yet, those are small species. Those are stuff that can be put into production very quickly, and you can have a, an harvest in, within one or two years. And putting those seeds into seed production, into a seed farm system, it means they can control the weed better, you can control the irrigation, fertilization, do mechanical harvesting, and cut all the costs that are usually connected to uh, seed collection from the wild. You can also have higher quality seed because you can control them better because they are at your site. And ultimately, all of this will allow to embrace an economy of scale and decrease drastically the price of seeds. I've got extreme examples in Europe. I used to be a seed collector and producer in Italy. And the cost of one very common Asteraceae species, Achillea millefolium, was about $1,200. In Germany, they set up seed production from that species and they're now selling it for about $80 to $100. So you can drop the price by 10 folds if you do it properly. Uh, in this simulation, we'll just, for example, drop the price of this seed by half. So instead of being 300, it's going to be 160. Instead of being 2,000, it's going to be 1,000, just for, as an example. And by dropping the price of those seeds, all of a sudden, our bill for seeds is no longer $2 million, but it's $1.2 million. Run all the cost simulation is always 100, but now all of a sudden the cost for a thousand established plant is down to 13 dollars. So from the original first simulation, we managed to drop the cost for a thousand established plant by tenfold. That was the last simulation. To wrap it all up, I'll show you now how the cost and the success uh, developed throughout all these different steps while working on different parts of the native seed supply chain. First example: simple broadcasting. It was about $250,000 and 1.6% uh, of the success rate. Then we go literally off the chart, at almost $6 million, a 50% success. Precision seeding allow us to drop the cost to 1.7 million and be more or less in the same range of success. When we do quality adjustment, the cost goes up, but also does the success, now all the way to 88%. Do the dormancy breaking and the processing, the cost will still go up a bit, but now finally we are up there. Adjust the number of species, and we can get 100% success at a cost of about 3.2 million. And as I said, from now on, we'll use improvement in the seed supply chain to decrease the cost. So by doing pelleting and using canola cedar, the cost goes down to less than $3 million. Then bringing down pelleting plus some good stuff, the cost goes all the way down to 2 million, and the last one, when we start to embrace seed production and buy seed that were cultivated in a seed farm, our cost is now down to $1.2 million. <clears throat> uh, let's look at the two other values that we have through the simulation, which is the cost for a thousand plant, our measure for efficiency, and our diversity index. First one, $162, not even one in the diversity index. Second one, we take it down to 115 and improve the diversity index to 23. Precision seeding, massive drop in cost. Now all of a sudden it's 32, cost per 1,000 plant, and the diversity is more or less the same. Then the cost is gonna fluctuate in the next few ones, 
But with quality adjustment, we will increase the diversity index. Dormancy breaking will increase it even more. And we finally reach 100% when we adjust the species. And throughout all of this, the price is always about $32, $31, $33. $33. Pelleting with canola cedar, $30, still in the range. Pelleting, adding some adjuvants, now we go down to 20. And at the end, embracing seed production on top of all of this, it goes down all the way to $13. If you want to read more about this topic and find more information about the native seed supply chain and all of these different steps, we've published last year uh, this document. It's um, freely available online. It's called the International Standards for Native Seed. You can Google it if you don't want to copy the link. And there's a series of publications that break down each and every one of these steps I just talked about. And then there's like one final document, the standard itself, that really outline the role of seed and the meaning of native seeds for restoration. Another very good document to have a better idea of uh, how the native seed industry works and operates in Australia is this recent survey. Uh, I've read it very well. I'm a good friend with one of the authors. And some of the results in this survey are alarming. Like, there's just simply not enough seed for the kind of restoration we have tried to do because there's not enough business doing it, there's not the scale, there's not enough production, there's not enough sophistication, there's no demand for seed quality testing, there's almost very little processing. So all of the stuff I've talked about today, they don't exist here. Our native seed industry is not doing them, and definitely not at the scale we need them to. And one last document it might be interesting to look at, to give a bit of hope, is like to look at the scale of how these operations are run in the United States. This is a document that was prepared by the National Plant Alliance and the Bureau of Land Management. This is one of the largest federal entity in America that owns and runs rehabilitation and restoration over something insanely huge amount of land, about one million square kilometers of land. And they've developed this plan for five years when the US government has been investing half a billion dollar to improve the, the supply chain of native seed because they understand how critical it is to get it right. When you've got those massive wildfires going through the, the Northwest or the Southwest, you need a reliable supply chain of high quality, diverse seeds to be able to bring it back. The consequences of not doing it correctly are devastating and they understand that and that's why I'm investing so much in it. And they're now in the process of preparing a next one for the next five years when they're probably gonna get even more money than they had before. So that's an example of what it should look like and there's like hundreds of seed companies working there and doing what we've been talking about already. And they still try to improve, they still try to do the pelleting, but that's, I think, the direction that we need to go as a country to strengthen the supply chain of native seed. That concludes my talk. I'd like to thank all the people, all of you for coming here today and the people online for being patient and waiting for us and delaying our beginning. And a special thank you for um, Zoe and for Michael that couldn't be here and especially to Haley that put great effort to make sure that all of this has come along very nicely. That said, maybe Kingsley wants to say a few words and then I'm available for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, uh, of course, this is um, the, uh, with the, we're within two weeks of finishing this part of the journey with the closure of the uh, ARC Centre for Mine Site Restoration. I don't know where the dog came from. It's a metaphor for the supply chain. Oh, it's a metaphor for the supply chain, chasing your tail. Well done. Um, but uh, part of these practitioner workshops is to engage and maintain the momentum of the programs that, that we've commenced. The investment so far by the federal government up, up to this point has been, uh, in the seed program, has been uh, approaching about $1.8 million all up. So there's a reasonably large amount of investment to get to this point. But I think we're right at the cusp now of the very exciting opportunities of seed production areas, plus the pelleting technology to have some very interesting opportunities, particularly in building microbial health in soils, complex carbon, um, improving plant success rates. Um, now, um, I have a question on notice that someone passed to me. So even 1.2 million seems a lot for 2,000 hectares. Could you provide a vision to what that could be if you're able to get all of the things such as the magic motions and potions around the pelleting? What would be a vision? Could you halve that? 
I, I don't know. <laughs> Ideally, yes. Ideally, by I think one of the crucial aspects there, yeah, the pelleting and the microbials can increase the way we efficiently use those very expensive seed. But probably the true key there to drop the price is to make those seeds cheaper. And to make those seeds cheaper, we really need to start moving towards like the, the production of seeds. Now I show the example of the, the like low-hanging fruits, the annuals, the grasses that can be put in production from this year and in two years from now we'll have them. But there's more to be done, for example, on the shrubs. Maybe on the trees are more long shot, but <clears throat> stuff you can put in production today, have them ready within a few years, and when those hit the market, then the price will drastically drop. You no longer pay $1,000 on average for a kilo of seed, but you're probably standing paying $100 or even $50. I had numbers from America when they use a, a native grass for the restoration program. They pay $12 a kilo. So that's really what's going to drop the price. But also we have to remember, we cannot do it just on a few species and say, oh, we got 10 species right, we're just going to roll them all over the landscape. We still to maintain the diversity. Because if you don't maintain the diversity, we lose the resilience of this ecosystem. And even if you do carbon projects, we're using just a handful of species, that's not guaranteed that the carbon is going to be locked up there for a long time. That system is not resilient. You still need to maintain the diversity, and you need to follow the principle of ecological restoration to be correct. So, sorry, I wandered off a bit there. No, that's OK. Um, other questions? Yes. My concern would be, you spoke of that um, seed dormancy is particularly prevalent in extreme environments. And so doing rehab on a mine up in the Pilbara, we're in that extreme environment. Have you ever thought about breaking the dormancy of a proportion of the seed, say 50 to 60%, and therefore you leave a proportion of the seed in, because you were talking about missing the rain, you lost 100% of your seed. So therefore, I would envisage in a seed mix I was doing in rehab would to be leave some of that seed in the seed store. So Mother Nature, if because you wouldn't want a little bit of rain, because it's not only about germinability, as you talked about, it's survivability. So having a seed store, I know you need seed out there quickly, prevent weeds, erosion, da da da, but you would want a seed store still left behind. Yes, so that is actually a discussion that is happening, like has been happening for years. Like I've been writing a paper on the use of seed technology to improve emergence. And there's always like a, this sort of conflict between, yeah, but we need to be a bit more bet hedging. Instead of putting all eggs in a basket, let's keep some for later. Personally, I think that the solution is more like about the timing and try to get it right. And that will really help. But that said, especially in extreme environment, might be worth, once we've got the data to prove it, yes, to do a bit of pet hedging. And they put out their seeds that with dormancy, they will resist in the, in the soil seed bank for longer. And that still brings back, for example, the, um, the seed pelleting. So because if you do the pelleting and then you put sub protectant around the seed, while they sit there waiting, instead of being predated, if you put some pr uh, protectants, then they won't be predated, means they can sit there in the ground for longer, waiting for the time. And um, at the same time, you've got species that are not dormant. So you put them out there, they don't get a tiny bit of rain to emerge and then they die. Well, you've lost them all. Instead, by doing pelleting, you can do pelleting that kind of creates an artificial dormancy. So you can use that one to do a bit of vetaging artificially. That stays there for longer. As I said, this is all theoretical. It would be great to be able to test it because we'll have some more data to prove why we're doing this. Because so far, even in America, when we're having this debate, there's not much empirical evidence of that really happening. Um, work that we did with Alcoa in the 90s, which was exactly around that hedging because we had the smoke capacity. And so we left seed unsmoked and smoked, put it into their trials in the hope that the unsmoked seed would eventually emerge later on to give us a bit of that uh, bet hedging. But of course it didn't happen because they were waiting for the smoke queue. So those seeds were lost from, this, from that residual seed bed. I think it's... Uh, it's a, an area that sounds simple in theory, but quite complex because you need to understand the dormancy uh, states once it enters the soil. Remembering once it's in wet soil, it's like putting them in a moist seed bank. They start losing their longevity. So, yeah, it's complex. I would say, though, Keith, that yep. it's been, been, been done for yep. 20, 30 years. 
So, yeah, yeah. And, and please list the species it's been done with. Yeah. But little science behind it. Yeah, 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 there's some evidence of it. I guess our model has always been pitching the farmer. So they remove the dormancy out of wheat, oats, barley and rye to get every seed success. And getting the niche right, which is what a farmer does, is what we're trying to do. But then going back to the seed supply chain to say, can we drop the cost of the input, the input cost of seeds into the system? And in the more arid environments you go to, you tend to get more species that are adaptable to seed production because they're fast growing, rapid maturing, and often you can get two cycles a year. Woody species in the southwest present, woody shrub species present significant problems in the two to five years to get seed production uh, ramped up. Other questions? Harley. Why don't you keep the microphone? <laughs> if you're, are, are you progressing with the uh, live seed production as, a, as an aspiration for the seed industry? You know, region, region, there's a West Australian organisation, regeneration organisation. Have you pitched that to them? Are they picking this up? So uh, <clears throat> I've been talking a lot with uh, <coughs> RIAWA, the Revegetation Industry Association of Western Australia. And uh, they are definitely interested. Actually, the people I've talked to, like they're very interested in pretty much all we do. Like not just the seed production, but the quality testing, the processing and whatever. But they are kind of stuck <clears throat> to the point that the customer is just interested in price. It's not necessarily interested in the outcome of restoration. So for them, they say, yeah, I don't want to buy seeds for you. Yeah, my viability, very clean seeds, but your seeds are like, um, I don't know, $1,000 per kilo, I can buy from this guy, sell him for $100 a kilo. And until you show through the 1,000 pure life seed cost what the difference is, they don't understand it. So that's the problem they have, and that's why they say, yeah, we want to do this, but we just can't afford because the customer doesn't want that. The customer wants whatever seeds as long as the right species so it can tick a box. That's one of the major problems, which is educating the seed users on all these things. And about the seed production, yes, they are keen, but there's a risk involved there, an economic risk that is very serious, because it is not clearly defined in Western Australia or in Australia in general what it's safely local. And everybody goes along and says, oh, five kilometers from around the area, that's what we want to get them. 200 kilometers, doesn't matter as long as it's Australian. As long as it's green, it's fine. So there's not a clear definition what we can consider to be local. And that is the major setback from them starting production because I'll set up my seed production, I get all the telotus done and whatever, but then they come around and they say, oh no, we cannot buy because it's not local enough. I'm 100 kilometers from where you got your seeds and whatever, so I cannot use them. You see, there's the risk. You all of a sudden got all your seeds that you cannot sell because there's not clarity around what the provenance is for seeds is. So there's something that needs to happen there. When we need to kind of bring all like knowledge and expertise, scientific expertise on the genetic diversity of these plants and then build it the practicality of it. So how can we build a sustainable seed farming system and merge those two? In America or in Europe, they've done something using seed transfer zones. So these maps, they say, okay, something that comes within this area, you can use. And something to kind of increase a bit the diversity is probably do their mixed provenancing. So you get from different populations, so you get enough gene material to give it their resistance put them in the ground, and eventually the selective forces on the side will select the best genotype for the area, minimizing the risk for a breeding depression. So that's kind of where the discussion is at. Kingsley, if you want to add something on that. No, no, that's fine. Okay. I hope you answered the, the question. Um, I'm really looking at this. What was that word? I'm really looking at this from a, yeah. an amenity horticulture perspective. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with very urban space, um, and it's, a, it's an ecotype that's unique in itself. Um, and one of the, the, the issues, and I, I really like this idea of um, seed production, in that um, uh, for, for amenity horticulture, for, tree, <coughs> pardon me, for trees in the urban space, we're, we're looking for particular forms of trees as well. Um, not just as a seed that will germinate and grow and provide more seed and provide an, uh, you know, part, be part of that whole ecosystem. Um, we're looking for trees that uh, have got particular characteristics right from the source. 
Um, so, uh, is there any? I guess the, there isn't any work at the minute, but um, it, it's really looking at being able to use that, that seed production type of approach for amenity horticulture for trees in our urban spaces, where it's a totally different ecology. It's a different uh, uh, setup, and and um, I guess is there any is there room for um, research in that area? I guess would be my question. I, I th think that you start. It's the opposite approach of what we're doing in restoration. In, in restoration, we try to get that genetic diversity of that natural population, keep it throughout the supply chain. So when we bring it back, we know that diversity is back. In your case, you're probably thinking about going down the route of selection or selecting sp particular phenotype because they'll work well in the environment. Yep. That's what they're doing, for example, in America. Like They do have selection programs to create the so-called native R's, which is uh, selected varieties of native species that can be used for some vegetation process in, in urban city. We haven't done it. Honestly, it's not my space. I'm more towards like the space of like getting the restoration right. But definitely, like if it's like, a commercial interest to do so, and there's like potential to develop those varieties in that direction, absolutely. Like someone will be keen to do the research. I don't think it's going to be me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Kingsley, do you want to add something in this space? Yeah, because it, uh, it goes to the issue in restoration of uh, climate adapted plantings. And um, I think the good news that we get from both the deep time work, the palynological work, which is looking at deep time profiles uh, in the southwest and uh, in our arid regions, is that much of that flora and species is pre adapted. So we don't need to be going and selecting species or selecting. Um, native R's um, that are heat resistant or drought resistant, we already have. For example, in Bankshire Woodlands, we believe we have a, at least a 20% tolerance in the mean shift of average temperatures and rainfall, already pre-adapted because they've been through those climate um, bottlenecks multiple times before. The issue is fragmentation, but um, certainly in the urban horticulture, the maintenance of elite lines is is why we see many grafted trees in plantings, simply to retain whatever are the urban elements that you want from those trees. So it's a, it's a different issue to broad scale restoration. Yeah, that's the above ground features, but uh, there's also root issues in the way that roots develop, and sure, that, you know that's another another. Spectrum to this as well. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Two more questions. Hi. Um, just the, I'm interested in the timeline for this, particularly when you get to seeds and suited to canola um, sort of planting style. Uh, obviously, canola goes in annually. Um, trees, for a carbon project at least, should go in every 25 years, you know. Um, well, they're there for, for permanence, 100 years, so that's it, done. So I'm assuming that you're using infrastructure that's already there. Um, uh, I'm not sure a canola style planter for restoration work that's done on a 100 year cycle or whatever um, would have the same economics. So there's two questions there, is where does the equipment come from? And um, the other one is when will it be ready for commercial sort of application? So where do equipment is come from? I don't know. I'm still looking for it. I'm still hunting for my first canola seed. Like it, it's worth before we can roll it out as to test it and to you actually rent it from. Hmm? Yeah, but from existing. Yeah, ideally yes, but we haven't got to this stage. Yet. Like we're now to the stage that we can understand how all of this work. Ideally next year, if we find the right collaboration, access to site, and everything, we can build up. It takes probably about part of a year, like to go through the seeds, do the testing, pelleting and whatever, because there's lots of development behind it. We haven't, we're not done yet. We're a long way from being done. And so next year, if we can try on a few hectares to test it, they'll be and collect some data about it. We know how it works. We know how it can be optimized. Because canola seed is, as a general idea, it works. But there's also seeds that are bigger than canola seed. So you need to put that in the mix. So there's probably some customization that needs to be done. And we need to collaborate either with engineers or companies that produce this sort of equipment to customize it and retrofit already existing equipment. Idea like would be to buy one of those and then start modifying it and test it. And maybe someday make it commercial for the company that developed it. 
so there can be a few of them going around. Which is not going to be like, in terms of the economical viability of it, it's not like canola seed that every farm has got one. Like here, for company doing carbon planting, they keep on going from site to site every year, and they'll carry along the canola seed with them. Like, if you see like some of the numbers about what is expected to be turned into carbon planting, or the, some of the goals for restoration in the UN decades for restoration, these areas are huge. And we've got this one, two months window to do it. So we probably need a few of them working through those two months nonstop through the Western Australia landscape to, to try to get some meaningful result. Because with a two row seeder, we, we just won't be able to do it in time. I think what Simon's also getting to is this is about a partnership arrangement into the future. We are not engineers. That would be foolish for us to dilute what we need to do, which is the tail end of this process. So we're talking to some people about that engineering relationship and there, there may be other people, uh, hydrologists, we may need to speak to pest management if red-legged earth mites, for example, become a major issue, for example. So there's a whole lot of partnerships to build, but the lead time from for this part through here to that part, that's been a six-year journey so far. So I guess we've got rid of some of the higher risks and taken some of the uncertainty out of the equation, but we're now at a very interesting tail end part of this in looking at it being commercial ready to go to site and the developments that need to happen and the partnerships that are needed to create that critical mass of both expertise, access to land and species diversity.